Hello, and welcome to the Healthcare and the ADA Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities webinar series. I am Pam Williamson from the Southeast ADA Center and will be your moderator for today's webinar. This series of webinars is brought to you by the Pacific ADA Center on behalf of the ADA National Network. The ADA National Network is made up of 10 regional centers that are federally funded to provide training, technical assistance, and other information as needed on the Americans with Disabilities Act. You may reach your regional ADA center by dialing 1-800-949-4232. Next slide. Real-time captioning is being provided for this webinar today. The caption screen may be accessed by choosing the closed caption icon in the meeting control toolbar. Next slide. As always in our sessions, only the speakers will have audio. So, you may type and submit questions in the chat area text box or press Alt-H and enter text in the chat area. If you are listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may ask questions by emailing them to adatech at adapacific.org. Next slide. This webinar series is intended to share issues and promising practices in healthcare accessibility for people with disabilities. The series topics cover physical accessibility, effective communication, and reasonable modification of policy issues under the Americans with Disabilities Act. These webinars occur every other month on the fourth Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 1.30 p.m. Central Time, 12.30 p.m. Mountain Time, and 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time. By being here, you are on the list to receive notices for future webinars in this series. The notices go out four weeks before the next webinar and open the webinar to registration. At the conclusion of today's presentation, there will be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. You may, sub again, maybe submit your questions using the chat area within the webinar platform. The speakers and I will address them at the end of the session, so feel free to submit them as they come to your mind during the presentation. If you experience any te technical difficulties during the webinar, you may send a private chat message to the host by typing in the chat window, type your comment in the text box, and enter keyboard strokes are all H to access chat box via keyboard keys. You may also email adatech at adapacific.org or call 510-831-6714 and that's voice and relay. Next slide please. I would like to introduce you to our webinar session for today. So, today's ADA National Network Learning Session is titled the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Final Rule Implementing Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Recently, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, also known as HHS, issued a final rule updating HHS's implementing regulation for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act concerning programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. This final rule will help ensure that people with disabilities served by federally funded and health and human services programs receive equitable care and treatment. The final rule contains a number of edits to ensure consistency with updated judicial and legislative requirements, including those contained in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Additionally, the final rule contains new sections to help ensure non-discrimination in health and human services programs and activities. We are fortunate to have today's speakers, 
John Thompson, who is a policy advisor for the United States Department of Health and Human Services for the Office of Civil Rights. He has investigated allegations of civil rights violations in public and private entities across the United States, negotiated settlement agreements, and helped draft regulations and guidance concerning discrimination based on race, color, national origin, disability, sex, and age. We are also joined by Maggie Hart, a policy advisor in the Office for Civil Rights at HHS. She is an advocate, an attorney, and a woman with a disability. Prior to join HHS OCR, Maggie was a senior counsel with the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs, and she was a staff attorney at Disability Rights DC, the protection and advocacy organization for individuals with disabilities in the District of Columbia. Maggie and John, welcome, and I'm now going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Pam, for that kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody. We are thrilled to have so many people joining this call and so many people registered. Um, we hope those who aren't able to make it here today are able to see the materials in the presentation on their own time. As Pam said, I'm Maggie Hart. I am a policy advisor with the Office for Civil Rights at HHS. Um, I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I am wearing a purple shirt that I think appears black um, with a black blazer and I am sitting in front of uh, a blurred view of my office and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So we're here today to talk about HHS's uh, final, new final rule with regard to section 504. Um, to give you a little bit of background, the last time HHS did a full rulemaking with regards to Section 504 was in 1977, um, and there had only been minimally updates, minimal updates on that since then um, until now. So this new rule officially goes into effect July 8th with a few exceptions that we'll discuss today. Um, in the meantime, the current HHS 504 rules remain in effect. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So what is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act? Well, Section 504 of the Rehab Act is a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in any program or activity that receives federal financial assistance. The rule we're gonna talk about today is HHS's implementing rule for that federal law. Um, the goal of which is to help ensure people with disabilities served by federally funded health and human services programs receive equitable treatment and care. Um, so I just want to say that again, 504 of the Rehab Act is a federal law. Many federal agencies have regulations implementing it. Um, the rule we're going to talk about here today is HHS's implementing regulation, which applies to recipients of federal financial assistance who are providing health and human services programs. Um, kind of, we've had some questions already uh, from the public about who does this apply to, who does this rule apply to. Um, and so, you know, who it applies and to and when it applies um, isn't changing a lot. It, it applies to entities that receive federal funding um, to administer health and human services programs. Um, and, you know, the individuals covered by it are uh, otherwise qualified individuals with disabilities. Um, so if you're trying to figure out, you know, does this rule apply to me? Well, you know, does your entity receive federal financial assistance to administer a health or human services program? Then you are covered. Um, and, you know, if you're providing services or benefits to an individual with a disability um, who is otherwise qualified to provide those benefits or receive those services, excuse me, receive the benefits or participate in the services, um, then it covers that individual. Um, and so, you know, we updated this rule because research has shown that people with disabilities are subjected to discrimination and bias by medical professionals, unfortunately. Um, and so by ensuring equal access to health and human services programs, 
we are hoping to promote more equitable care and treatment and um, hopefully better healthcare outcomes for people with disabilities. Um, as the slide says, the final rule was implemented, or excuse me, <laughs> the final rule was, uh, the rule was finalized on May 1st, 2024. Um, and it strengthens the civil rights protections for people with disabilities under Section 504. Um, I wanna talk about the history of the, the rule um, and what it took us to get to kind of where we are today. So if you could please go to the next slide. Okay, the notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, so for anybody who's <laughs> been involved in the rulemaking process before, especially at the federal or state level, you know that um, in order to finalize a regulation, it first has to go through the rulemaking process, including a notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, for this rule, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking or NPRM uh, issued on September 14th, 2023. That notice contained the changes and updates um, that we were proposing for the rule. It contained information about how to you know, review that and make comments on it um, and the deadline for those comments, which was November 13th, 2023. And between September 14th, 2023 and November 13th, 2023, HHS OCR received over 5,200 comments, um, which is great. <laughs> Commenters included regulated entities, government officials, healthcare professionals, people with disabilities, allies of people with disabilities, and organizations representing various interest groups. Um, we reviewed and considered the comments received when we were developing this final rule. Um, if you want to know more about the comments received or our responses to them, you can read all about that in the preamble to the rule uh, published in the Federal Register. I personally like to read those things. I like to read legislative history. Um, I may just be exposing what a nerd I am. But um, if you have a particular area of the rule or section of the rule that you're curious, you know, why is it written exactly as it written, um, you can look to that section in the preamble and discussion of, of the comments and the responses there. So as I mentioned, on May 1st, this rule was finalized. On May 9th, it was published in the Federal Register and it goes into effect July 8th. Uh, which is coming up quickly, with just a few exceptions that we will note in this presentation. Next slide, please. What does the finding rule change? Well, it updates and modernizes the HHS Section 504 rule prohibiting discrimination on the basis of disability. As I said earlier, it advances equitable health outcomes for people with disabilities by ensuring consistency with current law, addressing newer forms of disability-related discrimination, and allowing for equal access. Um, it also clarifies and strengthens civil rights protections for people with disabilities in areas like medical treatment, accessible web content, accessible medical diagnostic equipment, and child welfare programs and activities. So that's just some of the things it does. Um, I wanna get into a little bit more about this. You know, the rule essentially addresses change in disability rights laws since 1977, um, including changes to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which was, of course, enacted much more recently than that, uh, case law, and, you know, evolving um, use of technology, uh, updated knowledge just about the medical field, um, and then just significant changes that have happened in the health and human care and services industries um, since 1997. So my colleague, John, will talk more in depth about this in a minute, but um, the, for example, the some things that were updated for consistency with the ADA, not all, um, but a few of them would be, you know, the definition of disability and its broad interpretation, um, the sections related to reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures, 
um, section related to the maintenance of accessible features and a section on service animals. Those are just examples, there are more. And um, with regards to the ACA or Affordable Care Act, um, section 1557, as many of you may know of the ACA has many protections um, for people of various protected classes. And that includes people with disabilities. Um, there are numerous protections for people with disabilities in section 1557 that supplement the protections in section 504. And as I mentioned, there were a couple areas of discrimination that have emerged since 1977 or some areas where we have found um, the discrimination to be more intractable based on the complaints that we've received. Um, those include child welfare programs and activities, web content and mobile apps, and medical diagnostic equipment. I will talk a bit about child welfare programs and activities, but uh, my colleague John will talk about web content, mobile apps, um, anything for technology is a good question for him. <laughs> my uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the key provisions of the final 504 rule that we are going to discuss today are medical treatment provisions, value assessment, assessment medical methods provisions, excuse me, I'll say that one again, value assessment methods provisions, the child welfare programs and activities provisions, web and mobile app accessibility provisions, integration provisions, and changes made for judicial and legislative consistency. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I would like to kind of get into the meat of things here um, initially with the medical treatment provisions, which are section 84.56. Um, I wanted to start with kind of like what is encompassed in medical treatment. I think um, it's important that we level set what that is before we get into the details of it. And so the category medical treatment is intended to be interpreted in a broad and inclusive manner. Um, it includes services delivered as part of clinical research. It includes crisis standards of care, or, which are standards of care that determine prioritization of scarce resources in public health crises and other emergencies, um, something a lot of us have unfortunately become much more familiar with than we ever thought we would. Um, organ transplant policies, and many other relevant areas. So we know that in the medical context, denials or delays of care based on discrimination can have life and death consequences for people with disabilities or just poor health outcomes for people with disabilities. Um, and we know this through you know, research that documents it. And so we wanted to get at those problems um, through this provision uh, for, by ensuring that there's not discrimination in medical treatment and equal access to medical treatment. Um, specifically, the final rule says that a recipient may not deny or limit medical treatment to a qualified individual with a disability based on bias or stereotypes judgments that the patient will be a burden on others, or a belief that the life of a patient with a disability has less value than the life of a person without a disability. I'll repeat that. A recipient may not deny or limit medical treatment to a qualified individual with a disability based on bias or stereotypes, judgments that the patient will be a burden on others, or a belief that the life of a patient with a disability has less value than the life of a person without a disability. Additionally, recipients cannot deny or limit clinically appropriate treatment where it would be offered to a person without a disability in similar circumstances. And they cannot provide medical treatment to a person with a disability when they wouldn't provide the same treatment to a person without a disability 
in the same situation. Um, I think it's easier to understand those last two when you have examples. Um, but before I give those examples, I just want to say that um, the examples I'm about to give are just that. They are to clarify about uh, what we're talking about here today. They are not um, a statement on any position or determination by OCR. Um, we'll get into it in more detail in a little bit, but the complaint process and enforcement procedures um, remain in place and every complaint that we receive will be you know, investigated um, and a determination will be made accordingly. So these examples are just that examples. Um, so taking us back now to, to what we were talking about, um, as I said, recipients cannot deny or limit clinically appropriate treatment where it would be offered to a person with a disability without, a, excuse me, they cannot deny or limit clinically appropriate treatment where it would be offered to a person without a disability in a similar circumstance. So an example of this may be, um, I want you to imagine that there are two people, both of them have unfortunately developed pneumonia and the clinically appropriate treatment for that pneumonia is a ventilator. Now I want you to imagine that one of these people has an underlying disability of Alzheimer's disease. Um, it would be discriminatory for a doctor to deny the patient with Alzheimer's access to the ventilator because of their perception based on a bias or stereotype about people with Alzheimer's, that the individuals has a poor quality of life because of their disability. And then um, I wanna circle back to the, the last uh, prohibition against discrimination, which is that recipients cannot provide medical treatment to a person with a disability when they wouldn't provide the treatment to a person without a disability in the same situation. So as an, purely as an example, if you have two individuals who are capable of becoming pregnant, who go to the doctor and are seeking contraception, and, the, and one of those individuals has a disability, if the doctor denies contraception to the individual with a disability and instead only offers sterilization, that you know, may constitute discrimination under our new rule especially if it's done upon the belief that that individual may have a child with a disability. Now, the rule and HHS uh, you know, strikes a balance between preventing discrimination and um, respecting the professional judgment of medical care providers. And we know that people have particular training and skills and knowledge um, to help others. And so, for example, where a medical provider has a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for denying treatment, then it would not constitute discrimination under the rule. Uh, the medical treatment provisions also address consent and the provision of information about treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'd like to discuss the value assessment methods provisions, um, which is section 84.57 of the final rule. Uh, this is another one where I'd like to first talk about what are we talking about here? Um, because I think value assessment methods are newer. Um, and for those that use them, they know exactly what they are. And for those of us that do not use them in day-to-day -day basis, uh, may not have such a, a firm understanding of what, what are we talking about. So value assessment methods are um, analytical tools that are assessments and measures um, that are used for things like cost containment and quality improvement efforts in the healthcare context. They play an important role in determining whether a particular intervention, such as medicine, or treatment will be provided and under what terms. So an example of this may be 
step therapy, which is when a patient may be required to try a lower cost prescription drug that treats a given condition before they step it up to a recommended but more expensive drug. And so, um, while these methods can influence access to resources, including medications, they may lead to discrimination against people with disabilities when they place a lower value of life extension for people with disabilities. And the final rule prohibits the discriminatory use of the value assessment methods in analytics. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, um, the section prohibits recipients from using a value assessment method or tool that, one, discounts the value of life extension on the basis of disability, and two, is used to deny or afford an unequal opportunity for a benefit or service. So it does not prohibit the use of any specific value assessment method, only the discriminatory use of the value assessment method. Um, and I'm going to repeat that again. It prohibits recipients from using a value assessment method that discounts the value of life extension on the basis of disability to deny or afford an unequal opportunity or benefit or service to a person with disabilities. Um, I think this may be an area that people have a lot of questions. We're happy to. Um, answer as many as you can at the end. Uh, and also we do have our OCR mailbox um, for questions, which we will share with you as well. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, lastly, I would like to talk about the child welfare programs and activities provisions. Um, we're really excited about all of the whole entire new rule, but personally, um, as a former advocate and uh, litigator for people with disabilities, um, I saw I saw this type of discrimination happen. Um, and so, um, our colleague Claire, who's unable to be here today, worked really hard to make this as strong as possible, and um, we're we're quite proud of it. Um, so, I want to talk about the new provision. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say that the old rule prohibited discrimination by all recipients. And again, those recipients are entities who receive federal financial assistance from HHS to administer their programs. Um, so they were always covered, including child welfare entities. Uh, but despite that general requirement, we have found that there is a lack of awareness of the non-discrimination obligations in this area. Um, over the years, there have been a lot of complaints about child welfare programs and activities received by OCR and enforcement actions. Um, we've issued technical assistance and guidance, um, and unfortunately, the complaints continued. So we felt that uh, a specific section was warranted. The new section is section 84.60. And it specifically prohibits discrimination against children, parents, caregivers, foster parents, and prospective parents in the child welfare system. So it's great, it's a lot of people. Um, and recipients, so the entity may not based on speculation, stereotypes, or generalizations, deny qualified individuals with disabilities custody, control of, or visitation with a child. They may not terminate parental rights or legal guardianship of a qualified person with a disability. And they may not require children to be placed outside the home through custody relinquishment or other forfeiture of parental rights in order to receive necessary services. Um, I have unfortunately seen that one quite a few times, so I'm going to repeat it. Recipients may not, based on speculations, stereotypes, or generalizations, require children to be placed outside the home through custody relinquishment 
or other forfeiture of parental rights in order to receive necessary services. Uh, in addition to those you know, prohibitions against discrimination, the new section sets out procedures for parent evaluations. So parental evaluations must be based on evidence or research. They must be conducted by a qualified professional and be tailored to assess specific areas of disability related needs. The final rule clarifies that tests or other assessments of parenting ability must be focused on the parent's capacity to parent rather than they're evaluating the individual's disability. Um, additionally, they need to identify if individuals with disabilities who want to be parents need community-based services, adaptive services, or reasonable modifications in order to parent, and they must establish procedures for referring those individuals who need the adaptive services, community-based services, or reasonable modifications to those services. Um, so again, I, I wanna give an example. Um, as I said, discrimination on the basis of disability in child welfare includes decisions based on speculations, stereotypes, or generalizations. So for example, um, removing a two-year-old girl from her parents at the hospital because both parents are blind without any analysis of the ability of the parents to parent or consideration of the available support services and referral to those support services may constitute discrimination under these new provisions. That is the last slide that I have today. And so I will turn the mic as it were over to my colleague, John. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Maggie. Um, yeah, my name is John Thompson. I work with Maggie at OCR. Um, I am a white and Hispanic male with dark brown hair, a uh, short beard, and I'm wearing a blue shirt and red tie. Uh, pronouns are he, him. And I am gonna start off talking about our section on, oh, I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide our section on web and mobile accessibility provisions. So this is uh, subpart I in our final rule, and it's very similar to in April, Department of Justice published their Title II web access rule. So this is very close to that because we worked very closely with Department of Justice so that you know there'd be similar requirements. The main difference is that our rule, section 504, also includes requirements for the accessibility of kiosks. What we're seeing a lot in terms of hospitals, doctor's offices, is in a lot of cases, they're using kiosks to check patients in or do other services, which obviously means those kiosks need to be accessible to people with disabilities. So we included in this section that specific requirement. But beyond that, we're talking about the accessibility of web, content and mobile applications. Uh, we just wanna make sure that um, when these technologies are used for health and human services programs, uh, they're accessible so they don't create barriers for people with disabilities. Uh, this final rule imp implements a specific standard to ensure this non-discrimination. Uh, specifically, uh, it places a requirement so that the web content, mobile apps, must conform to a specific guideline, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline 2.1 Level A and AA. So that is I'm gonna call it WCAG 2.1 AA, which is an internationally recognized standard for web content and accessibility. Uh, it's used in Europe, it's used in various states in the United States to kind of help and make sure that people who really need to use screen readers or have other requirements can access the web content. And there are specific implementation dates for this so that recipients are required to make sure that with some exceptions, their web content and their mobile apps comply with this standard. Uh, for larger organizations with 15 or more employees, uh, they have two years before this rule goes into effect. And for smaller recipients, 
uh, with less than 15 employees, they have three years for this to go into effect. Um, now I'd mentioned that there are limited exceptions. Uh, specifically, there are five exceptions in this final rule. When the NPRM came out, there are a few other exceptions that we decided not to include, and I'll get to those in a second. But the first exception is for archived web content. And this really is supposed to be content that, you know, for all intents and purposes is archived. It's not used currently. It's essentially historical documents. It's not updated or changed. Um, obviously, for people with disability, it'd be better if they could view this, but we understand that for certain organizations, this could be just a mountain of documents and other files that are very rarely used. So that's the first exception. Uh, second exception is similar. This is pre-existing pre conventional electronic documents. And these are specific kinds of documents. Uh, there's an exhaustive list of the types of documents in the rule that are not currently used by the recipient you know, for any of its programs or activities. So they absolutely cannot be used for you know, applying for services or benefits. They can't be really used. They have to be only there for historical purposes. So very similar to archived web content. Um, the next exception, exception number three, is content that is posted by a third party. Now, and we also clarify, this cannot be a third party that's posting content on behalf of the recipient. If the recipient is you know, contracting with someone, for example, to do their bill payment stuff, then that third party, you know, it's absolutely not accepted. It has to be accessible. This is, you know, much more narrow. It's if, for example, I'm thinking on a website, there's the opportunity for someone to, a third party to post things onto a website, then, you know, the recipient can't really uh, govern everything that's being posted. So it's kind of narrow in that way. Uh, the next exception, it's a little confusing. This refers to individualized, password protected, or otherwise secured conventional electronic documents. What does that mean? It means documents that relate only to an individual. Um, so one thing that could mean would be, um, it could be the um, kind of the medical file or the medical records of a specific person. So if it's you know individualized and it's password protected, it's and it only applies to one person. And when I say that it's accepted and it doesn't have to conform to WCAG requirements, that just means you know to begin with it does not have to conform with requirements. If a person with a disability you know needs to access their medical record and it needs it to be accessible, there are still other parts of Section 504 that would require it to be accessible, such as the effective communication provisions, which are in subpart H, or the uh, reasonable modification provisions that are in section 84.68. So if someone with a disability tells their healthcare provider, hey, I do need my, you know, uh, my medical record and I have this specific disability, so I need it to be accessible, then the medical provider is still required to make it accessible. It's just as, you know, in general, for the entire general public, it's not immediately required to comply with WCAG 2.1. And then finally, one more exception. This is for pre-existing social media posts. So these are social media posts that were made before, you know, the recipient is required to come into compliance, whether that's two or three years down the road. Um, Obviously, like the other exceptions, we want to make sure it's forward looking and we figured that social media is not of the highest priority compared to the other programs and activities of the recipient. Uh, but all that to say, even if something falls under one of these exceptions, like I mentioned earlier, still there are the requirements for effective communication and there are the requirements for reasonable modifications. So other requirements within Section 504 may still require the recipient to make this content accessible. Uh, one other thing I want to note, uh, recipients can still use alternate designs or methods or techniques uh, if they result in substantially equivalent or greater accessibility. 
What we're really thinking about there is if, so we're requ requiring WCAG 2.1, but if someone wants to use instead the recently released WCAG 2.2, or potentially somewhere down in the future, WCAG 3.0 once it's released, uh, so long as that is, you know, an alternate design that's uh, substantially equivalent, then that's A-OK. -okay. We encourage that as long as it's substantially equivalent or greater accessibility. Uh, there's also kind of the exception for fundamental alteration or undue financial administrative burdens. It's very similar to the same exception throughout 504. Um, one also important difference. So when we released the NPRM, we asked a lot of questions on, okay, we understand we want to require WCAG 2.1, but how exactly are we going to enforce this? You know, is it going to be okay if there's some deviations? Would it have to be 100% compliance with WCAG all the time? Could there be, you know, other methods of measuring compliance? Could it be like a um, institutional maturity decision? Ultimately, we settled on, we want to make sure that um, a recipient can still be in full compliance. Uh, sorry, we want to make sure that a recipient would not be in full compliance uh, if you know someone can demonstrate that non-compliance has a minimal impact on access. It would not affect the ability of an individual with a disability to use the recipient's web content or mobile app. So we want to make sure if there is a specific deviation from WCAG 2.1, if there is something that's not quite in compliance. If it is so small and insubstantial that it does not affect a person's access to the web content or mobile app, then it wouldn't be, you know, a violation. And we really want to make sure this was a narrow exception so that if there is a significant issue, if there's a continuing issue, then it would be a violation. But if it's minor noncompliance, then it would not be a violation. And that is a little bit technical. Um, so I encourage if you have any questions on that to either reach out to us or, of course, read the rule itself. And uh, one other thing I want to mention, one of the big differences between the NPRM and this final rule, uh, we had other exceptions or were proposing them for a lot of web content for elementary schools, secondary schools, uh, post-secondary schools. Really, all the comments we received were very negative when it came to those exceptions. Uh, really all the commenters thought this would be a huge service to students with disabilities, and ultimately we agreed, so we got rid of those exceptions for elementary, secondary, and post-secondary content. You can go to the next slide. All right, another new big area is accessible medical diagnostic equipment. This is in subpart J. So we know that people with disabilities, uh, particularly people with physical disabilities, experience barriers to medical care because of inaccessible medical equipment. Namely, it's diagnostic equipment like um, exam tables, exam chairs, um, weight scales that you have to stand on. You cannot use a wheelchair in them. Um, mammography machines that you, know, you have to stand to use. Uh, so this final rule adopts the U.S. Access Board standards for accessible medical equipment to try and make sure that, you know, in the future where recipients, mainly hospitals, doctors, offices, clinics, when they're getting new medical equipment, they're making sure that it's accessible. And similarly to the web access provision, um, Department of, we've been working very closely with Department of Justice on this. They released their own NPRM on this topic on Title II of the ADA and likely will issue a final rule soon. But the big takeaway here is this rule requires that newly acquired, which can be newly purchased, newly leased, it could be a renewal of a lease, basically anytime you're getting new equipment or changing the ownership of equipment, anytime you get new medical diagnostic equipment, it must meet these new standards. That means things like exam tables must lower to 17 to 19 inches so people can transfer onto them. 
uh, means weight scales, you know, you must be able to use a um, wheelchair on them, things like that. And there are quite a few specific standards in the access board standards for things that you lie on in supine position, things that you transfer to, sit in, everything like that. And so when you're acquiring this new equipment, uh, you must acquire the new equipment until 10% of your new equipment uh, is accessible. So that's 10% for most healthcare providers, but it's 20% for facilities that specialize in treating conditions that affect mobility. And of course, this has to be at least one unit. So you can't say less than 10 or 10% is less than one unit. So zero units. No, it's at least one unit. Um, the MDE, it must be, sorry, medical diagnostic equipment or MDE. It must be dispersed proportionally across departments. Uh, so there's actually also a two-year requirement. So within two years of the July 8th date, um, recipients that use an exam table and or recipients that use a weight scale have to make sure that they have at least one accessible exam table and weight scale. So while basically all the other equipment we're saying, anytime you get new equipment, it has to be accessible. We're saying even if you're not getting new equipment, Within two years, you know, if you use these things, you have to have an accessible exam table and an accessible weight scale. There's also recipients aren't required to take actions that would be a fundamental alteration or undue burden. And we want to note too that recipients don't have to make sure each piece of the MDE that they acquire is accessible, just you know, up until you uh, meet that scoping standard. And there's also potential for other, there's limited potential for other methods uh, to achieve compliance and make sure that their program is accessible. You know, there could be a situation where a small clinic, you know, has an alternate location that has accessible MDE in certain instances where, you know, you're not putting the patient with a disability out. It's a similar distance. It's not difficult for them, you could ask them to accept services at the alternate location where there is accessible MDE, but those are limited methods. Um, importantly too, there's a requirement that the recipients must have qualified staff who are able to operate the accessible MDE. They're able to assist in transferring and positioning, and they can carry out the access obligations regarding their ex uh, existing MDE. And this is a section where not much changed between our NPRM and the final rule. Um, a lot of the comments we got were very positive. A lot of people writing in to say that, you know, the least we can do is accept the access board standards. We can move on to the next slide. Okay. Now, and it's section 84.77 deals with the integration provisions. So everything that we've included in this section is kind of already required, whether it's by 504, whether it's by the ADA, or whether it's by the Olmstead decision or other case law. But all this deals with making sure that people with disabilities are able to receive services in the most integrated setting possible. So we really wanted to make sure that all these requirements are, or most of these requirements are in one section. So there's, you know, not confusion over what is required of recipients. So this final rule, it reflect, reflects the principles established by the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision, other significant court decisions, and clarifies, uh, you know, services must be provided in the most integrated setting that's appropriate to the needs of the individual with a disability. Uh, it's meant to help recipients better understand and comply with their obligations and provides more details on the right to be served in the most integrated setting. So since 1999, essentially, this has been required, but we wanted to make sure that it was in Section 504. Um, yeah, so 504 and the ADA have been interpreted consistently, so this just made sense to us. And we want to underscore that people with disabilities don't have to wait until the heart of until the harm of institutional legislation or segregation occurs to assert this right. Specifically, what we're talking about is a blanket application 
It says you have the right to receive um, services uh, in the most integrated setting. And then we decided to define what constitutes a segregated setting. Um, it includes things like areas that are populated exclusively or primarily by people with disabilities, uh, regimentation, daily activities, a lack of privacy or autonomy, or policies that limit visitors or limit individuals' ability to engage freely in community activities. And then we add some specific provisions where we're basically stated these specific things could be, you know, result in unnecessary segregation or serious risk of segregation. Uh, one being establishing or applying policies that limit or condition individuals with disabilities access to the most integrated setting, uh, providing benefits that are more favorable, favorable in segregated settings compared to integrated settings, uh, more restrictive rules in um, integrated set settings, and failure to provide community-based service, which results in a risk of institutionalization. Um, once again, all this is kind of within the Olmstead decision, but we want to spell it out so it's very clear here. And there's also um, limitation for fundamental alteration, basically saying this a recipient can establish defense against the application of section if a request would fundamentally alter the nature of their program or activity. All right. And as Maggie introduced, um, there's a lot that we did beyond you know, these specific areas just to ensure judicial, judicial and legislative consistency. Um, limited updates to 504 since 1977. Uh, the one big one being the passage of the ADA. And courts already interpret Section 504 and the ADA similarly. So we wanted to make sure that just Everything within 504 is as aligned as it can be with the ADA. In addition to that, um, we want to make sure that it also accounted for updated case law. To that end, there are new sections on service animals. They're very similar to the ADA. Mobility devices, effective communication. Um, kind of a fuller list is additionally a broadened definition of disability. Uh, clarification regarding reasonable modifications, excuse me, uh, discrimination concerning the illegal use of drugs, uh, the maintenance of accessible features, retaliation, coercion, personal services and devices, uh, service animals, direct threat, uh, the accessibility standards, and then limitations for fundamental alteration and undue financial administrative and administrative burdens. We also tried to, wherever possible, kind of limit uh, phrases that are more out of touch, replacing emotional or mental illness with mental health condition, but with the understanding that there are certain other phrases from the ADA that we kind of had to keep in there. Um, yeah. And then we can go to the next slide. Okay. And we've gotten the question from some people about, okay, not only what are what's new in the rule, but how will this rule be implemented? What changes in terms of enforcement? So as Maggie has said, the final rule, aside from those specific sanctions that I mentioned, will go into effect on July 8th, 2024. And we're gonna be working very hard to continue to provide technical assistance, provide new guidance documents. Uh, there's also already some guidance documents on our OCR 504 webpage. Um, but the main takeaway I wanna have here is uh, we're still incorporating the enforcement procedures of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So our enforcement procedures from OCR, they have not changed. We still conduct investigations from that spawn from your complaints. So any time that you experience discrimination or you know someone who's experienced discrimination, you can file a complaint with us through our online complaint portal. 
You can file it in writing and mail it to us. You can call us on the phone or email us so we can investigate through those complaints. Uh, we can also initiate our own compliance review if we're receiving a lot of complaints against the same provider or a large provider. If we're reading reports in the news about issues, we can independently open up our own compliance reviews. And we're going to work hard to basically, in addition to that formal rulemaking, provide as much guidance, outreach, technical assistance as possible to make sure that, you know, all recipients, all members of the general public understand their obligations. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to provide just a few resources. Uh, here are links to uh, the full section 504 rule on the Federal Register. This includes, you know, the preamble. It includes the actual rule text. If you so desire, it has a link to our regu regulatory impact analysis, which is kind of all the costs that we estimate to be associated with this. There's also a link here to our current fact sheet uh, that explains a little bit more about Section 504, a lot of what we've covered today. And we are working very hard for to put forth additional guidance, additional technical assistance information so that, you know, we can continue to inform the public. Next slide, please. All right, and with that, I think we can get to any questions that you all have for us. John and Maggie, I appreciate all of the excellent information you've provided for us and people do have quite a few questions. So we'll get started and see how far we can get. Um, so first of all, um, someone has asked for an example of discrimination in a value-based assessment. So can so Maggie, I think that would probably go to you. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, as I said, this is a newer and pretty complicated uh, topic, I think. I'm sorry, John, you came off mute. Did you have something you wanted to jump in with? I do not know, sorry about okay. that. <laughs> um, so a, an example may be, um, if there is a patient who is um, needs a certain medication, um, but that that patient has an underlying disability, and so the the person determining you know whether or not to provide them with medication kind of gives the 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 value of life extension to them you know values them at say seventy five percent. And um, instead of 100, that would be discounting their value of life extension by like 25%. And then if that, that analysis were used to deny or them a benefit or service or uh, treatment, then that would be an example um, of a discriminatory value assessment. All right, thank you. So another question, uh, and John, I believe this was in your area. It says, my understanding is that while an individually password protected electronic document does not have to be made accessible, the medical platform itself would still need to be accessible. Is that correct? That is correct. It's the, yes, password protected document itself. It doesn't have to be accessible. With the understanding too that if the person with a person with disability um, would require that document to be accessible, and they inform the recipient that it needs to be accessible, then the recipient will have to take additional steps to make sure that it is accessible. But correct that you know the platform itself, if it is used by the recipient, you know has to be compliant with WCAG two point one double A. Okay. All right. And then this question is a little more uh, specific, but I'm going to throw it out there to the two of you. It says, uh, it, there's a widespread problem with individuals diagnosed with profound autism who receive home and community-based services, not receiving allied health services or access and instructive instruction in 
alternative augmentative communication devices. Will these updates to 504 help with this? Sure. And I will, I'll, this is John speaking. I'll begin with the augmented alternative communication devices. I think the effective communication definition for auxiliary aids and services within Section 504 is pretty broad. So depending on the specific circumstances, you know, an appropriate auxiliary aid or service could be, you know, the augmentative alternative devices. So unfortunately, it's a case by case determination, but that could be covered there for um, anyone with a disability who requires them. Yeah, and if I could add to that, um, since we're, sounds like discussing something within the scope of home and community-based services, the accretion um, requirement may come into effect here. So if the, the lack of AAC were putting them at more risk of institutionalization because they can't maybe participate in community-based services without that AAC, there may be some application of the, the integration mandate as well. Um, as John said, everything is fact-specific, but I, I generally, um, the rule may help. Great, thank you. So now we have another question. Uh, it says for web and mobile accessibility, how will you be enforcing this? Will there be audits and what would be the penalties for major violations? Thank you, this is John speaking. So in terms of enforcement, we're gonna be enforcing basically the exact same way that we have been enforcing because it's what's required of us by regulation. It's what we're allowed to legally do. That means we'll receive uh, complaints from members of the public. It means in limited circumstances, we can open our own compliance reviews. Um, we are not authorized you know, to independently do audits. I know there are countries, especially in the European Union, who have set up an audit type system. Unfortunately, that's not what we're set up to do. Essentially, we are going to rely on complaints. And in terms of, you know, how to determine whether a recipient is in compliance, um, there is that section at the end of subpart I, which discusses, you know, when something is a violation. And that means it has to be a situation where the deviation from WCAG does cause an issue with trying to access the program or activity. And in terms of penalties, it's once again, the penalties under Section 504 have not changed. It can be all the way up to uh, termination of federal funding. So stopping all federal funds from HHS, this person, which is really, you know, the ultimate that we can do. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, we have another question, and this is regarding uh, accessible exam tables. It says, are they required to have removable re or repositionable support rails? On the top of my head, sorry, this is John speaking. I would have to double check because there are requirements for transfer services. There are requirements for rails. The big one that sticks out to me is in terms of being adjustable in height but there very well could be. So I would have to double check with the US Access Board standards. And it's actually, if you would like to read the standards yourself as well, I always just uh, Google Access Board MDE and it's the first thing that pops up. And you can also uh, refer back to the webinar that we did about two months ago uh, with the U.S. Access Board and on their uh, accessible equipment standards. So, all right. So under, um, so, and this is another question, and so we may have to refer back to the U.S. Access Board standards, but for the accessible medical uh, equipment provision, does it cover wearable or mobile medical devices? such as a glucose monitor provided for a patient to take home, would it need to be accessible to someone who is blind or has vision loss? Absolutely. And this is John speaking again. So this applies only to medical diagnostic equipment. So this is equipment that's used to diagnose specific things. 
So primarily that's going to be equipment that's used by an efficient, sorry, by a physician or doctor, uh, usually in a healthcare setting in terms of, you know, rehabilitative equipment, in terms of therapeutic equipment, wearables, that likely is not going to fall under this, but that doesn't mean that it's not covered by Section 504 generally. It just means that these specific MDE standards might not apply. But in general, it still, if it's uh, offered by a recipient that receives federal financial assistance, if it assistance, if it's part of their program or activity, it needs to be accessible to the person with a disability. So still needs to be accessible, but it's just slightly different in terms of what standard applies. All right, we have another uh, question that's a little more fact specific, but um, we'll again throw it out there for you. It says, um, one of the problems we've seen inv involves Medicaid and the DD waiver. The state receives federal funds that they then contract with other service providers. Uh, they're working with a deaf couple who has a hearing child on the DD waiver, and they've been denied interpreters for almost all the meetings, assessments, and services. And then they arranged for the interpreter on their own. Um, and so now, and then the interpreter was not paid. And so now they're reluctant to file a complaint for fear of losing services. So is this something that would be covered under the new regulations? So I'm happy to take this one. Hi, everybody. This is Maggie speaking. Um, I, I, you know, I can't really opine on the specific facts, but I can say that subcontractors of the, the initial recipient are covered. So if states are contracting some, with somebody to provide their services, um, states that receive federal financial assistance for those services, or if they have like managed care organizations, those kind of what I would call like more on the ground actors that have direct service providers who are contracted with the recipient of federal financial assistance, they are covered. Thank you. All right, we have a question regarding uh, assistance with transferring uh, onto equipment. Uh, are medical staff required to fully lift patients in order to be able to do this based on the standards mm -hmm. and yeah. regulations? Thank you. Yeah. So at the very end of subpart J, it's the medical diagnostic equipment section. We require that staff you know, are trained and trained and able to assist with transfers. So it very may, very may well be the case because the patient can't transfer themselves or they choose, you know, not to transfer themselves using accessible equipment. They will require assistance, whether it's, you know, through a Hoyer lift. Uh, a transfer, some other method. Uh, so it is up to the recipient that's receiving these funds, you know, the doctor or the hospital, to make sure that they have a method to transfer the patient effectively and safely. What exactly that will look like could vary. It could be, you know, a physical transfer of multiple people. It could be a Hoyer lift. It could be a ceiling lift. Uh, as long as it is safe and effective, you know, it's allowed by Section 504. All right, great, thanks. Uh, we have another question. Uh, so will nursing homes be required to provide information about community services to people on Medicaid or Medicare that are submitted to their facilities? Is this covered? So I, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. Um, so if the nursing home receives Medicaid or Medicare, they're receiving federal financial assistance through HHS, so they're a covered entity. Um, and so any service or benefit that they provide has to um, comply with this law, including the integration mandate. Um, so if they provide transition assistance, it has to comply with the rule, including the integration mandate. Um, and there is, there are cases going on about that very issue and throughout the country right now. So it's a it's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. So this is one that we need to continue to look to the courts for for some more guidance. Well, it's it's I, I think that 
as I said, if, if they every if they receive federal financial assistance, they are recipients under this rule and they, they do need to comply with the rules. So including in their transition services. Right. All right, we have another question about accessible uh, web uh, content and applications. Does this apply to telehealth platforms as well? Uh, for example, ensuring closed caption availability. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is John speaking. Yes, the telehealth uh, platform, it's provided basically on the internet or it's provided through a mobile app. Yes, it's absolutely covered. And there are specific requirements within WCAG 2.1 for captioning. Uh, basically, any you know live video audio visual presentation has to have captions. So yes, absolutely, telehealth needs to have captions. All right. Well, we so we have some other questions, uh, and my colleague Anne Deschamps. Um, from the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center is going to help me with those. So, Anne, if you can take over at this point, I'm going to uh, let you ask those questions. Yes, they are coming in fast and furious. Hi, Maggie and John. Thank you so much for all this great information. But, you know, it's so detailed under each area that it, <laughs> as you both said, there are a lot of questions. Okay, uh, can you help explain the applicability of 1557 of the ACA as differentiated from the new rules on section 504 upon non-medical programs that are HHS funded service such as Older Americans Act. Yeah, I can I can start off with this. Uh, first off, I think section 1557 primarily deals with health programs and activities where um, Section 504 applies to both health and human services. So uh, the child welfare stuff, the benefits stuff is more on the human services side. So 504 is gonna do a better job covering that. Um, there's definitely some overlap in terms of what Section 1557 and Section 504 require for people with disabilities. I know 1557 has its own effective communication section talks about reasonable applications. It doesn't explicitly say, you know, web access or mobile apps, but it has an information and communication technology section. So there, one thing I wanna make sure is clear is the 504 and the 1557 requirements, while they are separate, you know, if a recipient, if they're covered by both 504 and 1557, then they're required to comply with both 504 and 1557. It's not an either or situation. But yeah, generally, when it comes to non-health programs that receive funds from HHS, it's more on the 504 side of things. Great. Thank you. Okay. Does OCR's guidance documents section include information that bolsters access requests for people facing electrical and chemical barriers, like smart meters or fragrant emission devices in clinics and hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is John, I'll take that. Um, I think section 504 specifically does not mention uh, electrical or chemical barriers uh, beyond the general non-discrimination requirements, uh, essentially saying, you know, prohibiting discrimination based on a number of factors. So if there is any situation where, you know, a person with some disability uh, in that area is being discriminated against, then we encourage you to file a complaint with us either through the OCR portal or through, you know, email or calling us directly or through regular mail. Um, this was an interesting question, a little bit different. Um, are there any provisions, and I think this is for both of you, are there any provisions that you'd hope to include in the final rule but were ultimately left out? Uh, I'll take this one just because I actually started working on this rule back in 2020, I think in the last administration. I mean, ultimately, the provisions themselves 
like broad sections. None were left on the cutting room floor. I think the only major change was that the medical treatment section, and we mentioned this in the NPRM and in the final rule, it used to be multiple sections. We just combined them because we realized, okay, all these things are getting to the same thing about you know denying medical treatment. Yeah. But in terms of what we included, I think there are there are changes throughout in terms of what is required by each section. I don't think there was any one section that got excluded. Okay. Um, another good question here. How will everyday people, disabled patients, know if a hospital is using a value assessment tool that discounts the value of our lives? We usually just experience the outcome, but how will we know if there was an official value assessment behind the care plans we were offered? Hi, everybody. This is Maggie. Um, that is a very good question. I think um, <laughs> that is that is one of the problems is we don't always know and write um, value assessment methods of the term here, but um, algorithms broadly, to use the term, uh, could be used in discriminatory ways that we don't know about all the time. I think, um, I guess I would encourage you to, if you think it's happened to you, you know, to, to file a complaint, um, we can investigate it. Um, okay, moving on. Um, when you have multiple cl clinics, where can I find guidance on when we can refer patients to other clinics for accessible weight scales and exam tables? It seems like this could be considered unreasonable if the physician only works in the primary clinic. Who could the patient get an appointment to get weighed, et cetera? Would they have to go to two separate places? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Absolutely. This is John speaking. That's a very good question. I think the underlying thing is we want to make sure that the patient themselves is not being inconvenienced. They're not having to go through extra hoops that a patient without a disability would not have to go through. So we want to make sure it's understood that it's kind of a narrow exception where if someone, you know, especially, you know, small clinics, clinics without a lot of resources are referring to other areas, it's not putting an unreasonable burden on the person with a disability. Maybe one way they could kind of try and mitigate that is by providing uh, transportation to the person with disability to other clinic. It's by, you know, limiting instances where they would have to go to another clinic. We really want to make sure, I mean, the spirit of this law is making sure that if you require an accessible weight scale exam table, you're not having to do more than, you know, your fellow patient without a disability has to do. So there isn't specific guidance saying X number of miles or this amount of minutes is how much you can have to wait extra. Unfortunately, it is one of those areas that will be on a case by case basis, but we want to make sure people with disabilities aren't having to jump through too many extra hoops. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how how that um, how that plays out. Um, if a recipient receives federal funding for healthcare service but also has other non-healthcare services, do the provisions of this new rule apply to the other services that are not healthcare related? Yeah. So generally, I think this will apply to all health and human services of a recipient. So it's, it's something outside of the scope of health and human services. Uh, Section 504 may not apply, at least for us at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, if you think, though, you're being discriminated against in some other program, we encourage you to file a complaint, you know, maybe with Department of Justice, since they coordinate Section 504 kind of across the government, and they're responsible for a lot of the ADA, especially Title III of the ADA. Um, okay, I'm departing from the script. This is a question that I have. Uh, are there any efforts 
to educate um, medical providers about these provisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is John again. We are absolutely at OCR, I can say, we're trying to figure out exactly what the best audience is. We are accepting every speaking engagement that we can. I can tell you this morning, actually, I did kind of an outreach to, it's actually a program locally in DC for future doctors, future dentists, and kind of explaining their requirements, not only for patients with disabilities, but also Title VI for race, color, national origin, just making sure that there is a little bit more understanding of what's required of them. We have done, yeah, listening sessions while we're doing the rule for Section 504 with a lot of um, organizations on the provider side of things. And we are actively searching out for other opportunities to make sure that you know, everyone, not just the advocates, not just the people who will have to ultimately file complaints are also, you know, aware of their obligations. Yeah. Right. In, in addition, we're developing um, additional technical assistance that will be coming in. Oh, good. So uh -huh. guidance documents? Yes. yes. Terrific. Um, okay. If a state provides Medicaid transportation for medical treatment, but routinely does not pick people up to go to appointments or leaves people stranded at, at medical offices, might that fall under your review if a complaint is filed? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think. I think it would depend on the particular facts, but it could, it, it certainly could fall under this. Um, and I would also encourage you to, as John mentioned earlier, look into the DOJ um, or state complaint level um, at potential violations of the ADA. Okay. Well, Pam, I know some have come in since, um, I was asking questions, so I'm going to turn it back to you. All right. So we have one more question uh, So that I would like to ask, and then we will wrap up for the day. It says, if a state law requires WCAG compliance of password protected documents, does the exception in 504 override that state law? Uh, I will say generally, uh, the state law, if the state has laws that apply, they can still apply them. Obviously, from our perspective, we're enforcing Section 504, so it, we wouldn't enforce the exception. I can't speak to, you know, what the states would do for their own laws. This is Maggie. Yeah, the, the standard rules of, um, like, the preemption of federal law apply in this case. And so um, they would apply in that example, most likely. Well, well, we, Maggie, John, we appreciate all of the information you've shared with us today and answering so many questions. And I know that we've got a few questions that we still didn't get to, but uh, so we are getting close to our time for the day. And I do want to um, let folks know that if you do still have questions uh, about the issue and you didn't get a chance to ask it, then please contact your regional ADA center at 1-800-949-4232. So you will also receive an email with a link to the online session evaluation today. And so please complete the evaluation for today's program as we do value your input. Again, we want to thank Maggie and John for sharing their time with us today. And uh, we uh, thank you for attending today's session and we wish you all a great day. Yeah, yeah. thank you all for your time and your thoughtful questions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has been terrific.